Uh, thank you very much for the kind invitation uh, and for the introduction, Peter. Uh, so I'm going to talk about TB treatment. Uh, I am going to have a, a lot of emphasis on uh, HIV, so I'm going to give you an overview, uh, issues around TB therapy, when to start, what to start, and quite a lot about drug interactions because they're becoming more and more important. And at, towards the end on iris and then a little bit about MDR and XDR. So uh, why is it important? Well, if you look at uh, this sort of map of where all the global TB cases are, you can see that uh, Africa, India, and where you are in Southeast Asia have got big bulges. And then when you look where the HIV is, uh, you also see the similar areas of the world where TB is, is where you get HIV. So wherever you see uh, tuberculosis, you see HIV and vice versa. And therefore, the treatment of these two conditions are really important. In 2017, and this is from, uh, I like these, uh, these sort of um, graphics from WHO. You can see it's the top infectious disease killer in the world, 1.6 million deaths. That's far too much for a disease that's uh, preventable and curable. Uh, 10 million people develop TB, and you can see the breakdown here in terms of men, women, and 1 million children. And with HIV, nearly a million people with HIV had TB. So, first of all, we have to treat all the TB HIV cases. So, first of all, we have to treat them with TB drugs, and we have to treat them with antiretrovirals. And that's where suddenly we get a lot of complex uh, interactions. So first of all, we have been trying for a long, long period of time to make TB treatment easier. At the moment, for drug-sensitive TB, you all know this because you treat TB, six months and multiple pills. You're lucky, guys, because at least you have isoniazid 300 milligram. We don't have that in the UK. We have to use 100 milligram pills. So our pill burden for our patients can even be bigger than, uh, than most. So one of the things is not only to shorten the, the amount of drugs to give, which has not been possible, but what about trying to shorten the time we give TB treatment? So people have looked at four months. His three studies, they all failed. We can't do it. We still stuck with six months so far uh, for drug-sensitive tuberculosis. So, so what about treatment? Is it affected by HIV status? Let me just show you this part of the curve here. In the tall columns are the HIV positives, and in the shorter columns, the HIV negatives. It doesn't take much to see that actually that there's a higher mortality if you have HIV TB than whether you have TB alone. And of course, it's pretty obvious many of these people are presenting with end-stage HIV disease, very sick, very ill, and, and can have other conditions. But what about side effects? So this is sort of grade three or four events, and these are the people who are free of those. So HIV positive patients have more grade three and four events than HIV negatives from this recent data from the IUTLD. So not only do you get more side effects, but the death rate's higher. So that means we have to really concentrate on those patients and, and manage them very carefully because of these issues. So one thing is, is how urgent is starting antiretroviral therapy in TBHIV? Well, this is a bit of a historic paper we published back in 2002. It took us over two years to get it published after multiple rejections. I then had a letter a year later saying this is one of the 10 best papers we've published in AIDS. So <laughs> don't give up. And basically, we just collected our data and we showed way back then that if you had a low CD4 count and you presented with TB, your mortality was very high unless you started antiviral therapy. So it was a cohort study. Ten years later, we had all of these fantastic clinical trials which showed the same thing, that actually antiretroviral therapy reduced HIV TB deaths and morbidity. Therefore, you should start antiretroviral therapy ASAP, at least within eight weeks and with a low CD4, two weeks. And what was great was the science. And this is what really drives a lot of this stuff. We need, even though it might be obvious, now everybody thinks, oh, it's obvious you've got to treat people. 
Way back then, people were very scared of giving people antiretrovirals and uh, TB drugs together. They thought this, it was too complicated. But the science has transformed all this into policy. So now, for those patients who are HIV positive with TB, start antiretrovirals as soon as possible and at least uh, within two weeks if the CD4 counts less than 50. No later for all patients than eight weeks. So, it's great. We have lots of uh, clinical trials telling us exactly how to manage the patients. But, of course, medicine's not always that easy. When you come to TB meningitis, we have a different view. And, in fact, starting early didn't improve mortality. And, in fact, those patients who started early had more side effects. So we still have this... It's one of the greatest challenges in tuberculosis, actually, is TB meningitis. And as Frank said, the diagnosis of it, the treatment of it, the management of it, and what to do. Anyway, so at least we know that in TB meningitis, uh, starting early, you might as well, you could wait a while, at least for eight weeks. Now, one of the biggest problems we have with HIV uh, treatment uh, in patients with tuberculosis is actually this drug, rifampicin. I know some of you, the Americans, like to call it rifampin, but it's the same drug, rifampicin. And the major problem is the use of rifampicin with heart. But without rifampicin in drug-sensitive disease, you're destined to treat these patients for many, many months. So we need rifampicin. So why is it important? It's a massive inducer uh, of uh, cytochrome P450 drugs. And you can see the, it's not just 3A4, which it massively induces. You can see it's a uh, dirty, filthy, horrible drug. It induces all of these enzymes in the liver, all of them, right? So you can see that there's a huge range of them that could interact. But it also, it induces this P-glycoprotein. Now, what does P-glycoprotein do? Basically, that when you absorb the drug, the P-glycoprotein pushes that um, uh, drug back into the gut and prevents you from absorbing it. So, look what rifampicin does. Look how it induces P-glycoprotein in the gut. This is just after nine days. And therefore, it not only has effect on, uh, on increasing metabolism of most drugs, but also it can have an effect on the absorption of drugs too. And, uh, and if you really want to know why I call it a filthy, dirty, horrible drug, it also induces all of these uh, genes. So, uh, uh, and I was looking at what Frank was presenting about genes. It's, you, you, if you were already started on TB treatment and then tried to see that whether or not your diagnosis was made, you better just check that, uh, that rifampicin isn't doing something to your gene assay. Okay, so uh, we've got a lot of issues with that drug. Now, having said that, we're not giving enough so I've told you it's a terrible drug, but I'm also saying to you, maybe we should give a higher dose. Now, this is a dose-response curve in the mouse model, and we give in this range, okay? But actually, it's just where the, where the, the killing of the bugs is just starting. And actually, why aren't we giving it right down here? And actually, when you look at this stuff, the bactericidal activity, when you give more, is much higher. And you can see here that actually there's been a clinical trial. And they looked at patients with less than 100 CD4 counts, who are HIV positive. And, and first of all, they did show this, that the mortality, if you wait for eight weeks with less than 100 CD4, was much higher than if you gave um, antiretroviral straight away. Exactly the same as all the other clinical trials. But also, look at this, the death rate was much less if you gave patients with low CD4 counts high doses of rifampicin. And you can see here, even when you compare it with the two-week immediate start, giving the patients two-week immediate start plus high-dose rifampicin improved the mortality. So perhaps what we should start doing is giving more rifampicin. But of course, people are worried about high-dose rifampicin. Does it cause liver toxicity? Here's just a graph to show the killing effect of a very high dose. This is 2,100 milligrams, right? That's a lot of rifampicin. And you can see here, even when you come up to high doses, that the number of patients, I know it's quite small in the end, who develop hepatotoxicity is variable, and it, does, it doesn't look like it's um, dose-dependent. So we may be 
think, well, we, we actually start to do this in patients with very low CD4 counts, is give them higher doses of rifampicin. And, it, uh, and also, for those people where we have a lot of trou trouble clearing the bacteria, we often then just double or triple the dose of, of rifampicin in them. So it's something to think about, about clinical practice. It still hasn't quite got into guidelines yet. Now, this other drug, rifabutin. Now, rifabutin's not been available in a lot of the world. Generic manufacturers don't seem to want to push it much. Of course, WHO guidelines are all rifampicin-based, so rifabutin's a, an issue, co-formulations, all sorts of things. But it is a useful drug if you've got issues with rifampicin. Uh, and um, uh, the problem is it's both, uh, it, it also induces 3A4, but it, and it also is actually a substrate as well. And there are all sorts of problems with rifabutin, uh, but the drug interactions aren't as bad. Uh, it can be administered with a boosted PI, which rifampicin can't. Uh, there's uh, some data on efficacy in non-HIV, uh, but it's expensive. $30 a month for rifabutin versus $4 a month for the rifampin, it's sort of too expensive. And there is some toxicity with it. Now, this is some data that we published about what dose of rifabutin is recommended with antiviral therapy, and this is with boosted PIs. As you know, with rifampin, uh, you can give super boosted doses of lipinavir, um, although they're not well tolerated. So we basically said rifampicin not recommended with uh, PIs, whether you use ritonavir or cobicistat. With ritonavir, uh, you could use rifabutin at 150 milligrams a day, uh, and with cobicistat, it's not recommended, but if you do, you can use 150 milligrams and maybe look at drug therapeutics uh, levels. Now, for a lot of uh, countries in the world, you don't have measurements of uh, drug levels of, uh, of the boosted PIs, and you don't have rifabutin. But it's interesting to know that if you do get into a jam with antiviral therapy and you can't use rifampicin, then rifabutin's an option. We did some, uh, the, there's very little data on HIV positive patients treated with rifabutin. There are some just descriptive studies, and we, we did this, uh, look, looked at our patients on rifabutin versus rifampin, and they're relatively comparable. This is just a cohort study. Uh, all I can say is that there's good data on HIV negatives, and there's very little data on HIV positives, but from our study, it looked just as good. So, what antiretroviral should you use? Well, the best data actually comes from um, ephedrines, and I know ephedrines is not the flavor of the month, but actually, if you really wanted to go for an evidence base with uh, anti-TB treatment, ephedrines for at least, you know, for the time you're treating TB is, is a great option because we've got huge amount of evidence, and especially from this, uh, this data from Luke Kamaya in 2013, uh, it was uh, a really good data. Okay, and that's from the STRIDE study, which uh, was a landmark study. But what about 400 milligram of ephedrines, which some people are using 400 milligram around the world? Well, we have PK data um, from our group at Chelsea Westminster through Marta Buffito and, uh, and, and the Liverpool group, uh, but we still don't have the clinical data. So it looks like you could use lower dose ephedrines with um, uh, rifampicin without affecting the, the dose of ephedrines, um, I mean, without affecting the blood levels of ephedrines by using a lower dose uh, at 400 milligrams. But as I say, the world's moving away from these things, but it's good to know that we could use them. Now, what about integrase? How are they with rifampicin? Well, the f one of the first studies to be done here was the Ral Raltegravir study, and basically they showed that uh, if you used 400 or 800 milligrams of raltegravir uh, twice a day, your viral load outcome was the same uh, with and without TB therapy. So you can use raltegravir. And it's interesting that both doses were used and both were effective at 400 and 800. Personally, we use 800 BD, and, and it's only an anecdotal thing. I'm a little always worried about what the trough level is with the 400 BD, and if patients miss a few doses, what could happen? Uh, especially as raltegravir is more relatively fragile in terms of developing resistance. But there is now 1,200 milligrams of raltegravir once a day, 
rather than the BD dosing, and we don't have clinical data with TB. So don't do this at home. Do not give, if you do use raltegravir, once a day with TB therapy, stick to what the data shows, which is either the 400 or 800 BD. It's for six months, of course. Then you can switch back. I put this in because there's very little data on rifapentine drug interactions, and as you know, rifapentine may be the big drug used in, uh, in TB prophylaxis uh, in the next few years because of the data that's come out. Uh, and basically, you can see um, uh, here, raltegravir alone, and then raltegravir and rifapentine, uh, 900 milligrams once a week and 600 milligrams once a day for five days. So it does go down, but it's still probably all okay and it's well tolerated. Now, what about dolutegravir? As you know, dolutegravir is the, uh, a drug recommended by WHO. There's a big rollout of dolutegravir. I know we've got the pregnancy issues, but when you look at this, there, there's um, a study called Inspiring. Now, I just want to tell you about this study. The, this study is not a randomized controlled trial. Okay? What it did was it gave 50 milligrams BD twice a day dolutegravir, not once a day. So remember, patients are taking once a day TB therapy, but they have to be on twice a day antiretroviral therapy if you're going to give dolutegravir. And all they then did has, was have this sort of arm, which they said was a, a, a comparison arm, which wasn't actually a control arm, okay? Just compared to see how it, <laughs> how it did with a comparator. It's, it's rather a confusing thing when you read it, but it's not a controlled trial. Uh, but it did do well. You can see the rapid decrease in viral load, which we see with integrases, and out at 52 weeks here, similar um, viral suppression. You can see the numbers are all small. When you look at the pharmacology, twice a day dolutegravir with rifampicin is the same as once a day dolutegravir without rifampicin. So it appears that we've got some data to suggest we can now use dolutegravir 50 milligrams BD. So if you're in a big program, patients on dolutegravir and uh, uh, they've got TB, you start dolutegravir in the, as part of the program, you have to give them one extra dose in the evening. Here's some of the other outcomes about the TB outcomes. And in fact, although the virological outcomes were very good, the TB outcomes were pretty good too. So, um, you know, in terms of the TB, it's not got a, 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 an impact. Now, what about then saying, hey, I don't like this 50 milligrams BD of dolutegravir. We, you know, it's really difficult. We've got patients taking drugs once a day, and, uh, and with a Fevrenz, we don't have to adjust anything. I can just give them a Fevrenz with the TB treatment. They just take it all once a day. It's fine. But with dolutegravir, twice a day. Can we give it, um, uh, can we just give them two doses of dolutegravir? Well, one of the problems is you only absorb about, even if you take 100 milligrams of dolutegravir, you're probably only absorbing about 70 milligrams. There's a peak on what you can absorb. Then you add rifampicin on top, and you can see a, a decrease in the, in the um, 24 hour concentrations of about 76%. However, I mean, most of the patients in, in all of the study subjects, they remain two to 14 fold above the protein adjusted, oh, I've got EC90, I'm sorry, that's come off the slide. But actually, even though it went down this much, uh, they still had enough dolutegravir probably for viral activity. So this needs to be explored a little bit more in a clinical trial, uh, which would be better than giving it 50 BD. With rifibutin, you don't have to adjust the dose. Here it is, 50 milligrams once a day. With rifibutin, no problem. So if you wanted once a day therapy, you'd have to switch your TB treatment for that. Now, what about bictegravir? Well, there's two problems with bictegravir. The first problem is you can't give it. It goes down far too much. Goes, uh, when, when you give um, uh, the rifampicin, you can see here's bictegravir in the black on its own, and here's what happens. Look at the troughs, they go right down, so you can't really give that. The second thing is bictegravir is co-formulated with TAF, and I'm going to talk about how TAF and TB uh, interact in a minute. So uh, we have raltegravir, 400 or 800 BD, and we have dolutegravir, 50 BD to give. Otherwise, we're giving a Feverens. So here's, here's this here, 600 milligrams. Can we clinically give 400? Maybe. PK looks good. Raltegravir, here's that, not the 1200, and the dolutegravir. So that's a summary of what I've uh, just showed you. What about the nucleosides? Well, nucleosides are, are interesting because um, most of the world is giving TDF, but there may be a move to TAF in the future. We don't know uh, how that's going to go. And one of the barriers to TAF is the tuberculosis issue. Uh, 
because no drug will be given as, a, as a, an approved drug by WHO if it has major issues with uh, anti-TB drug. Now, one thing is here, uh, when you look at the TAF levels, if you give TAF twice a day with rifampicin versus TAF on its own, the levels look very similar. Now, remember, I've just said we're giving dolutegravir BD, so if you co-formulated dolutegravir with TAF, then you just give it uh, twice a day. And so you could say, hey, hang on a minute, the TB issue could be solved uh, uh, if you give it with dolutegravir, because you're giving that twice a day, you're giving this twice a day. Uh, um, when you look intracellularly with this, uh, TAF-BD plus rifampicin uh, versus TAF on its own, uh, it, all, um, it all looks okay as well. So, but actually, it's all a bit high. <laughs> compared with giving TDF, right? So actually, you're actually giving a lot more, in, you're getting a lot more intracellular with uh, TAF once a day or with TAF twice a day and rifampicin. So what about doing this study? So uh, this was done again by, by our unit at uh, Chelsea Westminster by Marta Bafito. And actually, when you look at the TAF once a day with rifampicin intracellularly, it's higher than giving TDF, right? So actually, to clarify all of this, TAF, you could either give it twice a day, or if you look at this, TAF once a day is just as good as giving TDF once a day when you look at the intracellular levels. So it's really quite interesting that we, we could get to the stage Maybe that you do give dolutegravir once a day 100 milligrams if we could get clinical data and you give TAF once a day as well. Anyway, we'll see. Now, the last two bits of my presentation uh, are about iris and MDR. So iris syndrome is a headache, a real headache because, you know, you've got patients starting on anti-TB treatment uh, that you're trying to make them better and suddenly you're making them worse and they develop, this is a patient with large... Uh, lymph nodes, characteristic, this dusky red stuff, and you can see it's about to burst this abscess from a lymph node. And so what can we do about this in terms of treatment? Well, there has been a randomized controlled trial of prednisolone to prevent paradoxical TB iris, and this was from Graham Mench's group, uh, and it was published last year. And basically what they did was, when they started patients on TB treatment and then gave them antiretroviral therapy, at the start of the antiretroviral therapy, they either gave them prednisolone, 40 milligrams, or placebo. Right? So they said, look, everybody who's got uh, um, a low CD4 count um, will go on to prednisolone as well as their antiretroviral. So now you're seeing a patient for the first time and you're giving them <laughs> uh, anti-HIV drugs, other prophylaxis, remember, cotramoxazole, fluconazole. Now you're giving them TB treatment and you're giving them prednisolone. It's uh, a bit of a pharmacy they have to take home with them, uh, all right, to monitor. But what's the outcomes? Well, the outcome was this. They reduced the incidence of TB iris by 30%. They reduced the requirement for corticosteroids when people did have it by 53%, and they didn't find any infection or malignancy. It, one of the problems that we have in our setting is CMV retinitis, or Kaposi's sarcoma, when we give people steroids. But this was relatively short-course steroids, four weeks only, um, and so perhaps this isn't a big issue. Uh, but they didn't see any of this in the South African setting. It would be nice to repeat this in another setting where maybe the CMV is more prevalent, uh, um, etc. So, anyway, this is uh, very interesting data. But, now this has already got into some papers to say everybody with a low CD4 count, less than 100, who's starting, who's got HIV, who's starting on antiretrovirals, should also be given prednisolone. And we have to now decide whether or not this should be in the guidance or not. And, and that, I mean, we've got this piece of data. Should we get more or should we go with it? It's something for us all to think about. And I haven't quite got my head around it yet. Now, the other thing about iris is, do integrase inhibitors increase the risk of iris? Because what integrase inhibitors do is they make the viral load go down very quickly, although the CD4 responses aren't, uh, aren't very different whether you give any 
drug, a PI, uh, a non-nuke, or an integrase. And so there was this from the Athena cohort saying that integrase is, is an independent risk factor. In other words, it's, it's related that if you give integrase, you get more iris syndrome. So everybody was very concerned about this. So we then had the reality study where, where what happened with reality was for the first uh, three months of therapy, for the first 12 weeks, Patients with very low CD4 counts were given triple therapy with ephedrine and raltegravir was added into one arm. So they then looked at the raltegravir arm and said, well, uh, was there any difference? And actually they found no difference in either deaths or iris. So from this data, it doesn't appear from a randomized control trial that um, integrase inhibitors are associated with iris syndrome. And we then did a uh, meta-analysis of all the data and we couldn't find uh, an association. So we don't think there is an increased risk. So let's relax a little bit about this at the moment. Keep watching, keep monitoring, keep measuring, but um, it's not an excuse not to give an integrase. So finally, drug-resistant TB. And basically, uh, here's the definition, uh, pre-XDR and XDR TB. Uh, very serious indeed, you know, um, with, with, with high mortality rates. But, so, we used to have uh, 18 months to two years of treatment until this Bangladesh regimen came out, uh, which is now approved by WHO, which is basically high-dose gatifloxacin, ethambutol, pyrazinamide, clofazamine, plus for the first few months, canamycin, proteonamide, and high-dose isoniazid. So you can see a lot of drugs, but look at the cure rate for MDRTB. We've never seen anything as good as this in the past, really, uh, and, and a low death rate, okay? So this regimen has, is really uh, taken off, uh, uh, but there are now a lot of new drugs. After having waited uh, uh, nearly 50 years for any new drugs in TB, we've suddenly got a whole pipeline, and of course, we now know that bedaquiline, delamidid, and proteonamid are all out. But look at all these other drugs all following on um, and coming through the pipeline. And we've also got a lot of regimens. So this is, that's drugs. These are all these studies that are all going to read out in, in the next uh, seven to eight years. Okay, so there's a lot of stuff going on and also some post-marketing studies uh, looking at all sorts of things. So it really is quite an exciting time for the TB doctors, but they're having to be patient to get the readout of the studies because uh, the, um, it takes quite a while actually to get these done. And I think that they've learnt a lot from what we've done in the HIV field. Now, I've just uh, highlighted proteonamide and... and um, um, uh, uh, Levo here, uh, and just to say that some of the ambidaquiline, etc., that some of these drugs are inter will interact with our HIV drugs, and bedaquiline is the commonest drug now that's uh, been used in MDRTB. But we've got concerns. It's got a terminal elimination life of 5.5 months, and a bit like amiodarone, it can cause uh, accumulation of phospholipids in tissues. So uh, it's a long time in the system. Obviously, if you, it's going to save your life, it's a risk well worth taking. It's also, unfortunately, uh, metabolized by the cytochrome P450 system, so you can't give it with rifampin. You're not going to anyway, because <laughs> it's for drug resistance, but it's a shame using in drug-sensitive TB with rifampin is not a possibility. Uh, and also, protease inhibitors increase bedaquiline concentrations, and you get more hepatic disorders. And the, the biggest problem is the QT interval. So, in fact, you need an ECG machine, okay? So, again, a lot of places don't have them. They give the bedaquiline. <laughs> uh, but in our, in our sort of situation, uh, that's it. And you can't give it with delaminid because they both prolong QT. And then you add a, bit in, you add a quinolone in and suddenly you're uh, into a complete heart block. So, it's, it's a great drug, but you have to be aware of some of the concerns with it. Uh, um, with ephedrines, you can actually give it together. Uh, it, it doesn't really go down too much. You can see here 90, 90%, etc., or in, in terms of uh, in terms of the concentration with or without. So bedaquiline ephedrines, and here again we have ephedrines great in TB drug sensitive. I'm not trying to promote ephedrines. I'm just saying we have a lot of data on it, uh, and we need data now on dolutegravir and bedaquiline. Uh, 
And even though people will say, oh, there'll be no problem, uh, don't tell me there's no problem until we've seen the data because sometimes we get uh, unusual effects. Um, and now lapinavir, and here's the boosting effect of ritonavir, 62% increase in bedaquiline dose, so that could be very dangerous uh, for the QT, but maybe if you could adjust the dose of bedaquiline, suddenly the price is less, right? Because you're giving half or 30% uh, of bedaquiline to get the dose in the right range, because it's a very expensive thing. And in our country, we have to buy six months' worth up front. I can't buy it. We can't get dispensed a week at a time, and if the patient has a side effect or a problem, I can stop it. I have to buy six months. So I don't know if that's the same in your situation, but uh, and it's very expensive. So, in conclusion, um, there's, a, there's still a big treatment gap because of the undiagnosed patients, as, as, as Frank showed, but they, when you do diagnose them, we still have to treat drug-sensitive TB for six months, and we have to include rifampicin. The dose of rifampicin could be higher, especially in low CD4, and we've got data to suggest it improves mortality. Drug interactions are a major concern, um, and they, you really have to be careful. Uh, and there are lots of good websites, like the Liverpool website, to look these things up. The immediate treatment of TB and urgent HIV treatment is dependent on the CD4 and whether you've got uh, meningitic TB. Iris, are preemptive steroids worthwhile? It looks so from the study. Uh, and we've still got lots of problems with drug interactions. Uh, and with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening.